You know, we're lucky to live in a region with such great and interesting history. Some of it's well known, some not so much. We love to celebrate it all, and that's why we have the unknown stories of Western New York. Nestled in the foothills of the Allegheny Mountains, in the heart of the Genesee Valley sits the quiet community of Angelica. It's a place where today crosses paths with yesterday. In fact, the sign that welcomes you proclaims it a place where history lives. And what a history. The village of Angelica, the town of Angelica, was named for Angelica Schuyler Church. Angelica Schuyler Church was the sister-in-law of founding father Alexander Hamilton, the nation's first treasury secretary, and the man on the $10 bill. John Barker Church, who was Angelica's husband, got this tract of land as payback in, in some way for helping to finance the American Revolution. Angelica was a member of the social elite in the country's earliest days. Her correspondence illustrates her status, including letters to and from George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson. Angelica Schuyler, with the emphasis on the word Schuyler, a very, very prominent pioneer family, colonial family in the Hudson Valley area. And for her to leave her family and come here was, is a testimony to what the future was of our state and our country, because it was came, came right through here. The planned village was designed to be reminiscent of Paris, France, where Angelica once lived, with a circular drive in the center and streets coming in to form a star with five churches surrounding them. The circular drive remains today, in the form of the village park. I'm past patiently waiting, I'm past and who would have guessed that all these years later, Angelica Schuyler Church would be a central character in the hottest show on Broadway, a hip hop take on the autobiography of Alexander Hamilton and a show that sold out through 2017. And a Broadway show <laughs> brings the name Angelica sure. Schuyler Church back into the forefront. Well, she's prominent in, in the show. You know, honestly, we're trying to figure out here now how to leverage that to our advantage. By taking advantage of another example of the past and present coming together in this 211 year old village a place that the church family called home for generations. In fact, the final or terminal piece of Alexander Hamilton memorabilia remained in Angelica for more than a century. The dueling pistols used by Hamilton and Aaron Burr. The pistols were sold by the church family in 1930 when the family eventually fell on hard times. Uh, Angelica Schuyler was long gone and uh, her descendants sold the pistols to the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. Chase Manhattan keeps those pistols in close storage, but did make very high quality replicas that they often loan out. Replicas that soon will return to Angelica and one of the unknown stories of Western New York. It's green copper Angel Adored Dome can be seen for miles, and its ministerial outreach even further. This is the crowning gem of the city of charity that he built. All the people that he took care of, all the children, all the orphans, everything he did, he said she did it all, and he would point to the statue of Our Lady of Victory. And throughout his priestly life, he wanted always at some point to build a shrine in her honor. Father Nelson Baker always put his trust and faith in her. As a new priest, he was able to wipe out the young parish's debt through a direct mail campaign across the country. Three decades after that, after a fire badly damaged St. Patrick's Parish Church, he went to work to turn his ultimate dream into reality. So at the age of 79, without a penny, he began this magnificent building. Father Baker initially turned to some of the same donors he had appealed to through the mail. And that's how he paid for everything, as they started, they asked for a quarter. And he said, for a quarter, you can join our Lady Victory Association. You'll remember all our masses, novenas, and prayers here at the shrine, and you'll take care of our babies and so forth. And the money started coming in. But also added a new twist as construction began in 1921. And he asked everybody locally and across the country for $10 to buy a block of marble to help build the basilica. It took him five years. It was dedicated in 1926 in May. And when he went to Bishop Turner at the time to ask for the date for the consecration, Bishop Turner kind of laughed at him basically and said, well, Nelson, you know you have to have it paid for in order to have it dedicated. He said, oh, it's all paid for. Amazingly, Father Baker was able to raise all the money between 3.2 
and $3.8 million. So when you think about having nothing to begin with and having it paid for at the end, and you walk through this shrine that then two months later became a basilica, that's a miracle. <laughs> And today, this amazing house of worship stands as a shrine to Our Lady of Victory, but also a tribute to Father Baker's determination and faith. And now, as OLV begins its centennial celebration of the building of a basilica, just how it happened also writes a new chapter in the unknown stories of Western New York. Here in Buffalo, some streets get their names for obvious reasons. Take Court Street. There's the courthouse. And a short distance away, Church Street. A look up, there are the steeples. But what about College Street in Allentown? Where is the college on College Street? For the answer to that question, we have to go all the way back to 1836. College Street was supposed to be the western border of the University of Western New York, a college campus that would have sprawled all the way to Franklin Street, meaning most of Allentown would have been a college campus. So it's about one third of Allentown would have been this large college campus. This new center of higher learning was chartered by the state on April 8th, 1836. And they were looking to build a school that would rival Harvard or Yale. And they had reasons to be excited. Buffalo was growing fast after the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. So population was shooting up and industries and were starting all over the place. So yeah, Buffalo was booming then. The board of directors was a who's who of Buffalo. And they really needed an institution, some sort of higher level education for their population to take on more and more complex tasks as Buffalo grew. They actually never um, built buildings specifically for the college. The one year of classes that they held, they um, operated in a building at Virginia and North Pearl. A building that, by the way, still stands today. So what happened? In 1836, Buffalo was really growing. There was a lot of speculation happening, a lot of new development. Um, millions and millions of dollars of new construction was happening. And um, unfortunately, two big things happened. First, one of the biggest power brokers in early Buffalo, Benjamin Rathbun, went to jail for passing worthless banknotes, putting about 10% of the population out of work. And then there was the financial panic of 1837, which affected the entire country. Basically, everything kind of stopped in Western New York for a while, so the plans for the college kind of fell to the wayside. Even so, from now on, I plan to call the old pink the old campus pub, or at least that's the way it'll be listed within the unknown stories of Western New York. It's just one block connecting Vandervoort and Lincoln. Ganson Street may be small, but the people who lived there made a huge contribution to winning World War II. There's only 26 houses on Ganson Street and one small apartment building. And 41 boys just coming from this size street is just unbelievable. An unbelievable story told by retired North Tonawanda teachers Frederick and Cynthia Adcock in their book, The Ganson Street Tigers Go to War. Well, the first thing I wanted to do was to record the history because I think it's very important. And very close to home. This was family history, but also neighborhood history and North Tonawanda history. We they spent decades listening to the stories of Cynthia's Uncle Sam DePaulo about his youth on Ganson and going to war. He was one of four boys living here at 18 Ganson who went. The Adcocks walked me up and down the street sharing the stories they documented. Frank Tyrone lived at 44 and served in a secret deception unit. The Miranda family at 38 also sent four boys. Joe Miranda, the only tiger not to make it home. He was killed at Normandy and is buried in the American cemetery there. They were involved in every single battle, just about from Midway to the Battle of Okinawa. Just to be able to talk to them and learn their stories, not only from them, but from their families as well. It, it was a real honor. 40 men and one woman proudly serving their country, a country that their parents moved to for a better life in a neighborhood they pulled together during times of war and peace. They're first generation Americans. Ganson Street's the heart of Little Italy in North Tonawanda. And uh, as they were raised on the street, they played football and baseball on the street and that was their team name, the Ganson Street Tigers. I'm also proud of the neighborhood itself, um, in addition to the boys that went to war because the the home front effort 
was amazing. They, they planted victory gardens, scrap drives. Even the elementary students in North Tonawanda collected pennies and nickels and were able to purchase a picket boat um, for the war. And so it was a whole community effort. The last of the Tigers passed away a year ago, but the story of their service to country will now live on forever within this book and within the unknown stories of Western New York. Michael McBride tells me it was like discovering an ancestral pot of gold. And I kept coming across this strange name, Axel McBride. During the pandemic, this retired Rochester City engineer found himself digging into his family tree. I said, Exile McBride, is that like farming equipment? Is it a person, place, thing? What is Exile McBride? But he kept digging and struck gold in the form of news article after news article found via Ancestry.com. I ended up finding over 1,200 articles on Exile McBride between 1880 and 1911. About 1,000 of them? from Buffalo Papers. I said, whoever this guy was, he was a rock star in Buffalo. Exile McBride was born John Joseph McBride in 1842, and at a young age, he took an active interest in the Young Ireland Movement and Irish nationalism. He was forced to leave Ireland in 1862 to avoid prosecution for his activism, hence his nickname, Exile. He ultimately made his way to the United States and traveled the Erie Canal to Buffalo. In 1866, he took part in the Fenian invasion of Canada and was captured at the Battle of Ridgeway. Bishop Tymon himself helped secure his release. Well, I could not believe that this famous internationally known human rights crusader was my great uncle. According to the news accounts uncovered by Michael, Exile spent the next 40 years of his life traveling the United States at his own expense, speaking out against British oppression in his homeland. He addressed Congress, met with numerous mayors, senators, governors, and even four United States presidents. Exile's death in February 1911 made national news. His funeral was held at St. Joseph Cathedral, and his burial was here at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Brockport. I couldn't wait to come out here and find this eight-foot bronze statue of this guy, and I got here, and his grave was gone. Cemetery records show he was laid to rest in Section H, which is now almost completely void of grave markers, something that Michael McBride hopes to rectify. I hope to have a exile after all his entire life of dedicating over 45 years of, of uh, promoting uh, Irish freedom and independence, that we all have inalienable God-given rights uh, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to at least give the poor guy a gravestone again. <laughs> so. <laughs> The old First Ward has always been known for its hard-working, tough, and colorful characters. I think of him as kind of like the bull in, in the china shop of Buffalo's kind of genteel Victorian society. William James Fingy Connors was born in the ward in 1857. He's this, this person who, you know, isn't born into money. He's uh, kind of got this hard scrabble life. He works on steamships when he's young. He's uneducated. But, you know, he, he, was, he was kind of the perfect storm of uh, of intelligence, of drive, and he had this huge chip on his shoulder. Binky Connors uh, is a very complicated individual. He uh, gained his power by uh, becoming a labor contractor on the docks, on Buffalo's docks. Connors is a central character in author Richard Sullivan's five novel series of stories focused on the old First Ward. He became very wealthy and the power just grew. He eventually uh, became dominant over the Buffalo Police Department, over the judges, over the politicians. He put politicians in place. Connors established a financial foothold by running the labor on the docks and silos of Buffalo's waterfront. He's said to have employed about 3,000 men, making him the world's largest contractor in the business. But he wasn't always popular. In 1899, the scoopers went on strike over his business practices. He is said to have lowered wages by half over the course of a generation. He really did rule uh, by violence and threats and intimidation. But he parlayed that into other businesses and more power. He opened saloons, and if someone wanted to work the next day, they'd better drink and spend a large chunk of their pay in his tavern. He owned an asphalt company, a brewery, and even bought two newspapers, the Buffalo Courier and the Buffalo Inquirer, using them to squash his rivals. 
He amassed a fortune. He also became involved in politics, rising to the position of state Democratic chairman. Every five years or so, he's getting involved in a new business. And ultimately, I think it's he's driven by this attempt to earn the respect of the people who grew up maybe a little bit more privileged. He's trying to kind of break into that respectable Buffalo, um, you know, high society. And that's something that he's really never able to do. Finky Connors is remembered by history in many forms. Criminal boss, multimillionaire, political power broker, even philanthropist. Although some would argue that his philanthropy often helped the very people he forced into poverty in the first place. And now another colorful chapter in the unknown stories of Western New York. Paul Lewis has been visiting Allegheny State Park since he was a boy. But I had been hearing stories um, as I grew up about this Irish settlement and there was once an Irish settlement in the park. But it wasn't only the place that intrigued him, it was also the people. Again, I, the stories were all over the place. Oh yeah, these people came out after the Erie Canal, they had built the canal and they moved down and then, you know, it was, it was all sorts of stuff. So being a history teacher, he decided to sort through the rumors and get to the facts. And we went by pulling out some old maps of the park and seeing what we could put together. And sure enough, there was Irish Brook. The next step was exploring along Irish Brook. We're looking for certain signs. Okay, well, how are we gonna find this place? What's gonna be there? They came across this, foundations of old buildings. This was it. This was the place they once called Little Ireland. And only the start of Lewis's research. He decided to make it a project for his class at Cleve Hill. They ultimately discovered 12 original families once lived there. It was a settlement of several houses and even a school. It all began with Jeremiah McCarty coming here from County Clare, Ireland. It just kept unraveling. He winds up getting a job in New York City on the railroad. And that's what led McCarty to Limestone and the settlement Paul and his class would study a century and a half later. He assigned a family to each of his students and the research brought them to St. Patrick's Church and Cemetery in Limestone. Keith, this was amazing the way it fell together. Teresa Townsell lives in Seattle now, but she's a direct descendant of Little Ireland. It spanned from about the time of the end of the Great Famine in Ireland until the end of World War I. And she says the families that created this little piece of their home country were a proud and hardworking bunch. It has all the iconic stories of the the immigrant coming here and the hardship of the times, the, the kinds of things you see in Grandma Moses' pictures. But then oil was discovered in Little Ireland and its residents found a new livelihood, ultimately following the oil and the money to Oklahoma and Texas. Leaving behind these stones, a long line of stories, and an Irish chapter of the unknown stories of Western New York. Joanne Pierce grew up in Niagara Falls and after attending Niagara University, entered the Sisters of Mercy Convent. Ultimately, she found herself teaching here at Mount Mercy Academy in South Buffalo. Well, she was very thorough in whatever she did. I think that was a very nice trait. She was very thorough, she was very approachable, and she, she was a good listener. Sisters Margaret Mary Gorman, Marie Andre Main, and Sharon Erickson all taught with Sister Joanne and have fond memories. Every night after we'd have a hard day teaching, uh, we'd go upstairs in the convent and we would play games. She always wanted to play Clue. That was very... That was a Clue. <laughs> it should have been a Clue. In a 2012 interview, the now married Joanne Pierce Misco recalled her day's teaching and the day her future changed. I had been teaching school, and uh, I, I met an FBI agent who came to our school doing recruiting, and I talked to him. When you heard that she was going to the FBI, that must have raised an eyebrow or two. No, I was very proud of her, and I was not really surprised, surprised, because you could see she had potential. It soon joined supervisors at the Bureau saw that potential as well. She joined the FBI as a researcher at the Training Academy in 1970. But when the position of special agent opened to females in 1972, she jumped at the chance. I loved the work that I was doing. I enjoyed it immensely. And then this just happened. So it wasn't something that I had 
been planning to do or I thought was going to happen. This former nun from the falls was about to become one of the very first female special agents in FBI history. First case I had, we went out to, to get the guy and he found out that we were looking for him and he called back into the office. He was incensed that a woman was being sent out to get him. She had to overcome many things, attitude toward women in the workforce, as well as the physical testing. She rose to every occasion and paved the way for so many others, like Sandra Birch told. The things is, you know, they polygraph all of us, right? Yeah, you know, before we get the jobs. And I'm like, well, maybe that made it e her easier to get in if she was a nun. Birch told is the supervisory special agent of the White Collar Squad in the Rochester branch of the Buffalo Field Office. She is one of three women in supervisory positions in Buffalo. Where I read that her supervisor accepted her immediately, I think that put a lot of clout behind her, that the supervisor accepted her and, and assigned her the, the hard cases, and she was able to prove herself. Agent Birchtold says Joanne Pierce was a trailblazer. But to take on, you know, a class and walk into a room with only one other female, that's, that's intimidating. That takes a lot of courage. I honestly didn't see myself as a pioneer, you know. It was just a role that I had been fortunate enough to uh, become a part of, and I just was carrying out that the role of special agent. Seven decades later, and we still love Lucy. It's timeless. Uh, it's still fun, as funny now as it was 70 years ago. But I Love Lucy was more than just a piece of Americana. It was a groundbreaking show, and it star a groundbreaking force in Hollywood. One of the pioneering things about I Love Lucy is they, they shot on 35 millimeter film in Hollywood uh, with three cameras in front of a live audience. And that combination had never been done before for a TV comedy. And that basically invented how sitcoms, uh, many of them, are still filmed to this day. A testament to the show's popularity was the so-called Lucy effect. There were stories of reservoirs in cities across the country dipping when Lucy went to commercial break. And Gary Hahn of the National Comedy Center and Lucy Desi Museum in Lucy's hometown of Jamestown says those stories were rooted in fact. We know there was a study done in Toledo where during uh, when I Love Lucy was in prime time that water usage went down by 13 percent and then after the show ended on Monday night it went up by 21 percent. So. There, there are actual studies that showed that people were glued to their sets uh, during I Love Lucy. Here in Jamestown, you can take in the Lucy experience. Everything from putting yourself into an episode to walking through recreations of the sets. And that's where we sat down, a living room seen by millions every week. When little Ricky was born, which was January of 1953, uh, the same day uh, that Desi Jr. was born, but when little Ricky was born in the sh on the show, uh, they got a like a 71 rating and 92 percent share. And if it seemed like Western New York's little redhead was even more popular than the president, well, that's because she was. The next day was the inauguration of President Eisenhower, which only had 29 million people watching. So a lot, <laughs> so 50 million fewer people watched the president get inaugurated as they did I Love Lucy the night before. So all those people who said I like Ike, there were more that said I Love Lucy. That's that's. <laughs> I like that. Yes, that is correct. A beloved show that's now even woven its way into some of the unknown stories of Western New York. Well, actually, this isn't the original door. The original door sat in the original office building circa 1899, and it's broken up by um, this wall here. This plan has been a long time coming for John Dumrez Jr. As you walk in, you would have seen um, bottling lines. When John and his wife were scouting places to open Buffalo Brewing Company back in 2010, 662 Fillmore was the second place they looked at, but it was by far their first choice. The building's been neglected since the 60s. It's pretty much had no love paid to it at all. Um, but the history here, you can feel it when you walk in. You not only can feel it, you can see it. However, they just could not make the finances work. Fast forward 11 years, the pieces have fallen into place, and John has started the process of resurrecting the old Schreiber Brewery, one of the last existing structures in Buffalo that housed a brewery back in the Queen City heyday of beer making a century ago. So we're walking into what's often referred to as the mural room, and each one of these pockets had a mural depicting beer through the ages. 
Once completed, along with restoring this original space that's believed to have been a tasting room of sorts, the complex will house a new Buffalo Brewing production facility, tasting room and restaurant, warehouse space, and also a brewseum in the old Schreiber offices. This is where beer was made from 1899 to 1949. Brewing several beers using Schreiber's original recipe and artwork on the cans. King Manru was a play by uh, Paderewski. Oh, wow. And so that was like the... An the homage big, to the neighborhood. Yeah, correct, yeah. And for John, this project is as much about helping to develop a neighborhood as it is about making beer. You're kind of resurrecting the past while forging ahead to the future. Correct. But you're also preserving history, and, and not only history in beer, but the history of this neighborhood. Yeah, Anthony Schreiber was a huge benefactor for Broadway Fillmore. Not only did he build this brewery, he had taverns all throughout the city, but a lot of money, a lot of his wealth went back into the neighborhood, funding things like the Adam Mishkevitz Library, um, helping with other taverns, you know, and employing people. It's been part of the Valley landscape since 1894 when William Kreiner opened a drying house for the brewing industry here at 50 Elk. It's about Buffalo coming back and everybody's happy about that. Over the next few decades, they added a malt house and the silos to the complex, a facility that provided jobs to the neighborhood and malt to breweries from Utica to Erie, including Genesee, Kohler, Cooks, Iroquois, Simon Pure, and Utica Club. It's the history, it's, it's part of what we were here. The company operated until 1971, but the building stood vacant until 1975 when it was taken over by Buffalo Malting. They were in business until 1986, and then it sat vacant until Sean Wright and Jerry Young bought the buildings 32 years later. So we're very excited about the rebirth in this area also. Being architects, you know, I enjoy building new buildings, but bringing buildings like this back to life. There's something about a before and after that is so much more powerful. Young and Wright Architectural have transformed this historic and abandoned site into the silos at Elk Street, a mixed-use complex that's breathing new life into the neighborhood and bridging the gap in development between the old First Ward and Larkinville. This is what it looked like when we originally visited when they first took ownership four years ago. And here's what it looks like now. Young and Wright's team hard at work on their next projects Two apartments and tenants, including Cove Mill Barbering. Trinidad and Tobago native Oral Roberts says it was the perfect spot for his pirate and Caribbean themed shop. This has been really great. This has been so good. And the building is so rich with history and all this stuff. People come in here. I love walking around, showing them the place. It's also restoring the original purpose of the site, bringing beer back to Buffalo. Briar Brothers Brewing opened its doors just a month ago in the footprint of this facility, which once was instrumental to some of the most iconic beer brands in the state. The building was originally a malt house. We've been looking for a tenant like Briar Brothers because we just figured that, you know, beer belongs in this building in one way or another. It's full circle, it feels like. I mean, being able to bring beer uh, to a building and serve beer out of this building, that was such a uh, pivotal role in providing Brewer's Malt for breweries between Erie, PA and Syracuse, New York for all those years is, uh, is just something that like you dream of when you're trying to start a, a microbrewery. And a dream rooted within one of the unknown stories of Western New York. Do you have an unknown story that you want to be known? You can reach me at peter.gallivan at wgrz.com.